Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. Turn around and say hi to three or four people around you and tell them that you're so glad they're here today. Glad to have you all watching at home also. A wonderful day to worship the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer and we will begin service today. Our Father, we love you and praise you and thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. We just ask for your blessings upon this service, dear God, and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we just thank you and praise you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Here's what's happening at Kimberly City United Methodist Church.
together and sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. There's not quite a thousand tongues in here, but let's do our best. <laughs> As we go before the Lord in prayer today, there are many that are counting on us to pray for them inside and outside of our church. And uh, as usual, we want you to think of one or two people that you know need a touch from the Lord. But let's also remember those that have been displaced and, uh, in Florida through the hurricane. It's, it's a very, very tough time down there. So if we can remember them also, let's pray right now. Father, we thank you and praise you, God for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege to bring our petitions before you. Father, we lift up our brothers and our sisters that need a touch from you today. May they feel your presence. May they be encouraged. May they be lifted up. We pray for those that have been uh, touched by Hurricane Ian and, and down in Florida, Father, that you would encourage them and lift them up. And, and Father, we just thank you and praise you for the many people that are, that are volunteering and helping. Father, we just ask that you just protect them and be with them. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Only God can move a mountain. Only God can calm the sea. Only God can heal a broken spirit. Only God can hear my heart's cry. Only God my sin atone. Only God can give us calm assurance. Only God.
This choir started singing that, and I was just, wow, that is so beautiful. <laughs> and yeah, I wanted to applaud through the whole thing, but it would have been impolite, so I tried to wait to the end. But tried. We do appreciate our, our choir here. And you know, if you spent much time around this group of people and being part of this church, you've discovered that you're in the midst of some wonderful, wonderful people. Generous and kind and compassionate, courageous and strong and caring. All of, all of the qualities that you would hope that we would all aspire to, you'll find in these people sitting right here. And again, another reason why I just love being part of this. Uh, we're still in this series called Immersed. And today's topic is simply a refreshing drink. We've talked a little bit about it on this theme about how to be fully immersed in the, the faith, the Christian life, and your relationship with Jesus Christ and the people that God has put into your life. And so today we're talking about the topic of a refreshing drink and really from the perspective of how do we truly get our thirst quenched. You know, we can say a lot about our relationship with Christ. We can say a lot about connecting with others, but where does it all come together for us in a way that is really satisfying, where we're contributing and where we're supported and we're supporting others? And today I want to try to uh, paint that out just a little bit, but I think we all have a thirst within us for that kind of satisfaction or fulfillment in life. And I don't know if you've ever been just physically thirsty. If so, you would look a little bit like the guy on your screen right now. And I used to, I haven't done it since I moved down here, but I used to get out in the afternoon in the summer and run, uh, do trail runs in the afternoon. And my favorite time is if it was 100 degrees. I just love that. And, uh, but I would chug two or three bottles of water before I head out and have some more waiting for me back at the vehicle, you know. And sometimes I would even need to find some shade to cool off a little bit in the middle of that. But you learn a lot about yourself uh, whenever you're getting really thirsty and pushing the limits of dehydration like that. I think that spiritually people are pushing the limits on dehydration and they don't have that extra bottle of refreshment, that extra thirst quencher waiting for them a few steps down the road or at least haven't planned for it. That's why I want to get through this message in a way that will set you up more in that, in that very same way. And it's really about people. If you've ever seen the movie The Shining and you noticed or saw what happened to Jack Nicholson when he disconnected from society and took his family to this totally isolated winter retreat. Some of you have probably seen that. Or if you've seen the movie Castaway, you know what four years on a desert island did to Tom Hanks. His new best friend forever became, yep, a volleyball. We weren't made for isolation. We're made to be with people. Consequently, we don't cope so well with being isolated. Studies show that lonely people tend to be more hostile. Did you know that? You do now. People who are lonely do tend to be more hostile, and they start eating foods that are higher in sugar and uh, prone to higher blood pressure and increased levels of stress. And when this goes on for an extended period of time, it starts affecting everything in life. And get this, eventually begins to affect their cognitive abilities. That's what happened to me. <laughs> Experts say that one of the causes of uh, the opioid crisis and the mass addiction that has come along with that can be traced to persistent feelings of loneliness. You know, one of the primary effects of opium is that it soothes the feelings of isolation, the feelings of despair. It just kind of soothes that out for people. Reality is just that we weren't made to be alone. You know, some solitude can be an essential part of being emotionally healthy. We all love to have some time of quiet contemplation in our alone time. But it's the exception. It is the pulling apart for that solitude and alone time and then going back into a circle, going back into um, social interaction and uh, relationships with other human beings. 
simply saying that isolation can't be the only option on our menu. We need social activity. You see, we need the life-giving, life-affirming connection that we experience in our relationship with others. I want to look at the scripture that I'm uh, speaking on today. It's just one verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 10. And it simply says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. If you wanted to pick out a single verse that would describe how we function as the church or as the body of Christ, I would probably go to this one. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. There's a lot of trust in that kind of statement. So many people are afraid that if they honor others above themselves, their own needs never get met. And so we come back to, I got to look out for number one because nobody else is going to. But imagine an environment where everybody is lifting up the needs of others above their own. In that environment, no one's needs are neglected, but elevated and respected and honored. And no one gets overlooked. And we're all lifting others up above ourselves. Now, that's, that's an ideal scenario, but that's the picture that Jesus has for the church. Last year, not last year, two years ago, there was an article in U.S. News and World Report that published the results of a study where it said almost half of all Americans, and technically 46%, Almost half of all Americans say that they struggle with loneliness some or all of the time. And again, almost as many feel isolated from others. That's 43% here in America. And feel that their relationships lack meaning and purpose. Surprisingly enough, the younger the age, the higher the numbers for feeling loneliness. Just, I'll throw this extra in. Did you know that men tend to uh, experience loneliness more than women? Did you guys know that? Yep, it's true. It is absolutely true. Let me get into this just a little bit, though. I have just a couple of thoughts for this. The first one is simply that serving is the greatest gift. If there's ever any discussion, conversation, debate over what is the greatest gift, if we're talking about spiritual gifts, I understand that in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, there had been this kind of conversation about what were the greater spiritual gifts. I'm going to say today that serving is the greatest of all the spiritual gifts. It is indeed the greatest. Here's a couple of reasons. First of all, is it gives us credibility as God's messengers. Look at the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Paul said, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Notice, he acknowledges his freedom. He belongs to no one. No one has any claim upon his life. And yet he says, I voluntarily choose to make myself a servant to everyone with the end result of, I hope to win as many as possible to Christ. And that is what shines in our, our Christian life. Our message is a whole lot more than what we say, isn't it? It is our service that gives us credibility as the messengers of God. And we are indeed messengers of God. Don't mistake that for a moment. All of our life is speaking a message. And more than anything else, we are all called to invite people to know Jesus Christ. All of us who name the name of Christ are called to invite other people into that incredible and beautiful relationship that we have with him. But our words go a very short distance. Our words bounce off the walls and fall to the floor. But when we serve... When there are people with a need around us, when there's a disaster or a family nearby who's facing a crisis and we step up as individuals and as a church and we help and we meet the needs, suddenly our message has much greater credibility. It is our actions as the people of God that speak so much louder than our words. Just maybe our words will be heard 
if our service is genuine and authentic and doesn't overlook the needs around us. But yeah, service is the greatest gift in giving us credibility as God's messengers. A second thing is this. It unites us as God's people. It pulls us together like nothing else will. You talk about the fellowship and the bond that we have in Christ, and uh, there's questions as to where is the greatest fellowship. Most people think it's eating pizza and cheeseburgers, and I really like that, by the way, and getting together with other people and doing that. I truly do. And some people say, no, it's when we sing hymns together or worship songs at church. I like doing that too. But friends, that's not where the greatest bonds of fellowship in the body of Christ are formed. It's when we serve together. There's a greater bond that comes when we work alongside others and accomplishing something. Just have you ever gone to uh, one of the days where the church is doing service projects all over the place all day and you're teamed up with three, four, five people that you've never worked with before and don't even know all that well and you're given a project to do? There's a lot of self-discovery that happens in the first few minutes of that, isn't there? But there's some maturing that takes place. Usually what happens is we go into that, and one of the first things you realize is that there's five of us here, and we all have different assumptions about how this job is going to get done. We've all stepped into this with just an underlying assumption about the way this must be done and everything else is wrong. We're not going to get very far together in that situation unless most of us can back off on being right on that, at least for the moment. You understand what's happening here? We're starting to honor others above ourselves and saying, I'm not the most important person in the world. I might be right on this, but I would rather be a friend to these people than to prove that I'm right. And so we back off on that and honor them above ourselves, and we, we find a way to not have conflict with them so that we can get to know them better and accomplish things together. And then a little deeper into that, you start to realize that one person in the group has a certain skill set and somebody else has got another and they complement one another really well. And you're just kind of surprised at that and you marvel at that. Then you notice maybe there's a natural leader in the group that the others start looking to uh, for what, what do you think we ought to do next? I think this, but what do you think? And there's that collaboration that starts to take place and leadership emerging. But here's what happens. Through all of the give and take, through all of the learning patience, through all the self-discovery and getting to know others, then eventually you complete a project together. And you stand back and you look with some satisfaction on that. But now something has happened. You have bonded with that group of people in a way you'll never bond with any other group of people through your service together. Now, you wouldn't have accomplished that eating pizza together, I don't think, or cheeseburgers, or name it. It's a different bond, isn't it? We can have fellowship and do food and potlucks and all those kind of things. We can do hymn singings. We can do our front porch old-time gospel together. All that is beautiful, and it's a wonderful time together. It's great worship, and I'm so thrilled for the people who participate in that. But it's when we serve side by side and achieve together and we get to know one another and work together that we genuinely bond. It unites us as God's people when we serve together. There's no, other, there's no greater bond than serving together, and it frees us from our selfishness and self-centeredness. But our serving needs a platform to be genuine, to be authentic, and to even provide us the opportunity. And I'm saying are serving in a community of worship, a community who worship together is invaluable. In order for us to be rightly connected to others in a way that supports our spiritual growth, we need to be a part of a community of worship. I'm just simply saying this. There are countless ways you can connect with God. Lots of ways to connect with other people. But there is nothing that compares with being surrounded by other people that are praying quietly in a time of worship. They're asking God to pour out blessings on the other people in the room with them that are seeking God's presence in their own lives. A community of worship is different. And it's a platform 
of safety and security, for exploring our gifts and learning to serve. We learn so much from that. It's called the church. And, you know, I have 100% empathy and understanding for people who, uh, during COVID, got out of the habit of being in a community of worship, who got into a habit of watching a church service online or watching three or four different services online or parts of different ones and feeling like part of that. I commend everybody who's remained connected by uh, connecting in that way, by worshiping in that manner. And yet I'm going to add to this. Whenever you feel it's safe, whenever you feel security about it, whenever you feel confident enough to step out and step into that social circle, that or spiritual organism called the church, you're going to experience a whole lot more. There is just going to be more of the spiritual food and resources that you need for your soul's health and that will satisfy that thirst within you once you get into a community of worship. And by the way, you're here, so you're doing that. Isn't that beautiful? Thanks for being here today. I'm so glad that each of you have chosen to be here. Some of you have maybe had to uh, drive a distance to be here. Some of you have maybe had to overcome some fears and, and, uh, and use some courage to, to get past, uh, even though there's not as much going with COVID now, some people have compromised immunity and, and uh, health challenges. So it might be a big deal. And if that's your case, I especially thank you and appreciate you coming out and being in worship with us today. It's not a small thing, and I truly hope that the blessings you're getting are more than worth it. Thanks for being here. And you know what? Let's just do this a lot. This is a good thing. There's nothing like it, nothing to compare with this. I hope that that's your experience that you're having connecting in this church today. It's a beautiful thing when you're surrounded by a community of worship. The second thing that makes our service meaningful, purposeful, and satisfying is when we find ourselves in a circle of appreciation. You might say a circle of grace or a community of grace, but I was just pondering this. I, 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 made, I made this big discovery this week. You're going to think it's really profound, and that is simply this. Grace is a church word, and I say it at church. It means absolutely nothing. It's just a sound. I'm not wrong on that. So how do we describe that? A circle of appreciation makes a lot of sense. Where if we want to say grace is extended to us, that means we're not being judged and we don't have to earn acceptance. We don't have to earn appreciation. We're just appreciated just for being. That's what grace is about. And you find a circle where you fit in like that, you've got something very rich. A group of people who love you as you are, who accept you as you are, who forgive you when you need to be forgiven, who encourage you when you fail, or with you through thick and thin. Interesting quote that I came across this week was from Robin Williams. I'll share that with you and see if it resonates for you. He said, I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone, but it's not. The worst thing in life is ending up with people who make you feel all alone. I went to uh, John Goff's 90th birthday party yesterday, and there was a crowd of people there. As a matter of fact, I recognize many of your faces right here today. And when someone is 90, they have a lot of friends who are in advancing years as well. And so I was in the room just full of people, and several of you were there, and I couldn't help but just have a very warm feeling for being part of that. There were couples there that I know have been married over 50 years, several of them. There were people there that I know have gone through very difficult challenges in their own health just in the last months and couple of years. There were people there who are caring for a spouse who is chronically ill. And what I was seeing was 
the depth of appreciation these people have for one another. The degree of compassion that they show and their absolute zest for just living is unequaled. The fun that they experience by being among others. All of those kind of things. And I look at this group of people and I say, you know, I want to be around people who are facing life with that kind of acceptance of others, with that kind of long-term love for someone else that they have been with all these years, understanding and adjusting their own expectations when things change, compromising as they need to because of the important relationships they have, and above all of that, the courage that they face the challenges of life with. And I'm talking about the people in this room for the most part. These are the kind of people I want to be with. Absolutely. And so, just adding to that, I would say, to satisfy that need within us and our place to serve and connect, seek out those who are willing to accept you and to affirm you before they try to fix what they think is wrong with you. And, and friends, as a church... We're not rejecting anyone. No questions asked. You come to worship here, you're accepted. You come to be part of this, you're going to be loved, you're going to be appreciated, you're going to be affirmed. Nobody has to agree with everything going on in someone else's life to give them acceptance, to show them love, to withhold their judgment and extend grace. That's why I love being here. These are the kind of people who do that very thing with the new person, with the outsider, because in that circle, the outsider becomes an insider immediately. But seek out those kind of people. Seek out those who will embrace you and include you in spite of your faults, who don't reject you and push you aside emotionally or for any other reason. Here's what I'm saying. Those people do exist. They do exist right here. There are people in this room right here, right now, who are ready to be that kind of friend to you and who need you to be that kind of friend to them. It's the body of Christ. It's the hands and the feet of Jesus, the heart of God in this very world. Let me wrap up, though. What is it I believe you could take away today? It's simply this. As we talk about what you can take home today, we inspire one another to service. We stick together and we give each one the encouragement that they need. The community and the circles that you belong to, they are a vital part of your spiritual health and your emotional health, but primarily your spiritual health. Take advantage of that. Let it be that refreshing drink that your spirit needs. Of course, that means both in giving our service and showing one another appreciation for serving. The environment is just like we read there in Romans, and it goes back to where we started. If each one serves and each one shows appreciation for the others serving, each one honors others above themselves and puts others' needs first, then no one is overlooked. Everyone is loved, everyone is included, everyone is affirmed, everyone is accepted, and everyone shows compassion and acceptance to others. It's called the body of Christ. It's the church. And so, that's where you are today. I hope that you're appreciative of those around you. And I hope that you are the one going the second mile to be the one affirming and loving and accepting others and being that kind of friend before we try to fix anybody or tell them what's wrong with them. Uh, let's just forget all about that and let's just express acceptance and love and appreciation. As so many of you know, we don't have the future to someday later show that appreciation. Let's do it now. Let's pray together. God, each person that you brought into this room is so valued by you, so precious in our eyes as well. 
And God, we look around and see people filled with compassion while facing the challenges they all have. And our heart goes out to one another. It's a very tender situation when we realize we all need each other. We all need love, acceptance, and appreciation. So let us all show those things to everyone around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And this is a communion Sunday. So we're going to go ahead with our time of communion together and just preparing our hearts now. I think I'm going to start by some hand sanitizer, according to Lydia, right here. See that? It's a good idea. Let's join together as we prepare our hearts for communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the bread of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word, the Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread he gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out now your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 